I want to welcome you to the Winter Leadership uh, Training Series. This uh, course is Building Relationships for the Mission, and it is specifically for members of the Staff Parish Committee and for pastors. Uh, my name is Laura Alton. I'm the Uvori District Superintendent. Uh, Bev Copley uh, is the Northern Piedmont Superintendent. She is uh, my, my uh, co-leader. Uh, we're a great team. And this includes Wanda Wallace and Lynn Gilbert, who are the administrative assistants in the Northern Piedmont District Office. So we want to make a good and white beginning um, by watching uh, a video uh, B U M C. Lynn? Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for that. Um, as people are coming in, I want to remind you to uh, go ahead and mute yourself. Um, I do believe that this is recording. Uh, there is a recording going on, so that's important for you to know that. Um, you may want to send questions that you have for, for our presentation to Londa Wallace. Send that in a private chat. I also want to remind you that when we finish our time together today, about 3.15, um, we will conclude this Zoom call, but you will be given a link to go to uh, a breakout room, a, a different link, a different Zoom link to go to a room where your superintendent um, will be um, hosting so that you can have dialogue and uh, more specific questions and answers with your district superintendent. We'll remind you of that again at the end of our time together. You'll also get a packet of information, which includes a copy of the slides that we'll be showing to you. So if you don't, if you feel like you don't get to take as many notes as you'd like to, uh, you'll, you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. And at this time, I'd like for us to uh, join our hearts and our minds together as we go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for how you have called us to follow you and to serve you. We pray that you'll give us open eyes, open ears, and open hearts so that we may learn from you and from one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bev Copley uh, is my colleague, uh, at, a superintendent of the Northern Piedmont District, and she is going to uh, lead us in some Bible study. Hey friends, uh, I'd like to start where United Methodists always start, and that is with scripture. Uh, we are people who are centered uh, in scripture, and I, I can't think of a better place uh, to begin than with a spiritual guidepost from Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians. Just a tiny bit of backstory. You may recall in the book of Acts around the 16th chapter, uh, when Paul is considering going east, and he has a vision from a Macedonian man in a dream, and he says, come our way, uh, come help us uh, in the land uh, that we now call Greece. And so he went there and uh, he was surprised to find uh, a, a place of prayer by a stream, a creek, really, tiny river. And uh, the, the, back, the backdrop of where I'm coming to you from is a picture of that place. I have visited many times, uh, that place of prayer. Uh, that he found in Philippi and the, the saints that he met that day, he forged an incredible relationship with and he loved them. Uh, they were uh, such a blessing to him and his ministry. 
he was a, a true blessing to them. Uh, so Philippians is a personal letter. It's a thank you letter. Um, it truly is Paul's letter of joy. And to me, it's just a great example um, of a relationship between a leader and a congregation. And so I think that it's a great place to start because each one of you on the call today are leaders. Uh, you're leaders from staff parish committees. Some of you chair those committees. Others just um, attend as important members. Some of you are vice chairs. Uh, some of you have been on for many years and others are just beginning. Uh, and you're also on this call, superintendents and pastors uh, who are always forging relationships. And the relationships that we are forging are biblical relationships uh, based on on some of the principles that we'll read about in this scripture. Uh, this helps us, uh, Philippians does as a guide uh, to ministering in relationships with joy, with working through concerns rather than being divided by them. And uh, it really is a, a reminder of the self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ that we can see in our relationship. So I just wanna share just a few verses from the beginning of the letter of Philippians. Really, it's a greeting and it's a good way to greet you today. I thank my God every time I mention you in my prayers. This is Paul speaking to his congregation and, and watch as I read for the places in bold because uh, I'll come back to them as, as touchstones for our work today. I'm thankful for all of you every time I pray, and it's always a prayer full of joy. I'm glad because of the way you have been my partners in the ministry of the gospel from the time you first believed at the stream behind me, perhaps, until now. I'm sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I have good reason to think this way about all of you because I keep you in my heart. You are all my partners in God's grace, both during my time in prison and in the defense and support of the gospel. God is my witness that I feel affection for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. This is my prayer that your love might become even more and more rich with knowledge and all kinds of insight. I pray this so that you will be able to decide what really matters. We will come back a lot to that today. What really matters. And so you will be sincere and blameless on the day of Christ. I, play, I pray that you will then be filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes from Jesus Christ, in order to give glory and praise to God. I want to take just a, a couple of minutes to, to think about the takeaways from Paul's experience and to invite you to use these words um, at one of your staff parish meetings soon. Um, the takeaways that I receive is that we are always partners in the mission. And the mission is the gospel. And the mission is the thing that binds us. The mission of Jesus Christ is this thing that we are submitted to. And uh, it's not a lordship of personality. It's a partnership in the gospel. And Paul's understanding of that was paramount to his success as an apostle and to the success of the churches in the ancient world. He was the greatest missionary that has, has ever walked. And he took his experience of the living Christ and he helped every community that he met to join him in partnership with the gospel. Uh, the mission's always first. Um, I, I answer a lot of phone calls, a lot of questions, a lot of emails. And, and some of those questions come out of something that's being moved to first place beyond the mission. And one of the good things about this passage and one of the good things about my work is simply to remind people of the mission, which is to reach people with the message uh, that, Christ gave to Paul and that Paul gave to the early church and that we are to give to our world. Um, another good word about this, and, and that reminds me of the part of Philippians, the God who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God remains at work over time and God remains at work across appointments. 
I've been serving the local church since 1989. That seems a, a more positive way to put it than to tell you how many years I've actually been serving because that would make me feel old right now. Uh, but in, since 1989, I've come a long way in understanding the way that God works in churches over time. Some of us who are pastors think that the history of the church began when we got there and it ends when we leave. But the history of our churches is long history. It's long devoted history to uh, Methodism, to United Methodism, uh, to the premises of being UMC in the world today. And uh, for all of us, lay leaders and clergy, we did not begin the history of most of our churches. We are simply stepping in to a place in time to be faithful. Grace is a part of that faithfulness, and grace is a part of partnerships. When I'm recruiting for staff parish chairs, um, I recruit based on spiritual gifts. Discernment is a top gift I look for. Wisdom. And because I'm a human being, I also look for mercy in staff parish uh, member, members in the committee because we need that. And grace is a part of, of mercy. Love and insight grow as relationships grow. That day that Paul showed up right here at the, at the river behind me, um, he did not have the relational uh, credentials at that very moment, but all of the folks who were gathered there, the leading women of the community, they had an openness in their heart to receive him. And uh, the love and insight grew as their relationship grew. And as you know from reading Philippians, each of the chapters, all four, is about the joy that's found in Christian relationships and putting Christ at the center. Uh, not the words of one particular verse of the Old Testament, uh, not theological premises that are just something out in the netherland, uh, but real love of Jesus Christ. And the best thing I think about staff parish work and the partnership in Philippians 1 is we get to decide what really matters. You all are the stewards of what really matters in meetings. And I hope that one of the takeaways today is that the mission is what matters most. The mission that people learn about the love of Jesus Christ. Our hope, our hope, and this is everybody's hope, and Paul just highlights it for us, that all of us will be found sincere and blameless. Um, I'm doing all my work every day aware that Jesus Christ is my judge and my hope, and I hope to be found sincere in his sight, and I hope to be found blameless in his sight. Uh, we desire fruitfulness, and we desire to honor God. Um, as we think about uh, today, I, I want you to begin to roll around in your mind some things that have come up in staff parish meetings in the past. If you're clergy, you might think about some times when it's been a really great conversation. You might even come upon some times when it's been really hurtful. Uh, same with those of you who are chairing and sitting on these important committees. Think about a time when you have been in a long, long conversation about something that really, really wasn't important in the scheme of the mission. Remember today, if everything matters, then nothing matters. Um, and we weigh what is going to be important in our conversations. And what's important in the theme of this work is the relationships, not only with each other in the body of the church, but among the staffs and uh, with the district superintendent and with the bishop. So we're going to focus on relationships today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Laura, uh, who's going to talk to us about what do we do after we have said yes to being on SBRC? What now? Thank you, Bev. Uh, and indeed, it is, um, it is what now. That is that is the question. Whether you've been on uh, Sam Parish for many years or several times, or this is your first time being on Sam Parish, um, I want to lift up four ways to think about um, your work. Um, first of all, um, we use our spiritual maturity to live out. Um, our baptismal vows. We have said yes to following Jesus Christ, and we are growing in that relationship. And our service on the staff parish committee is a part of that journey. It's a part of that discipleship. So this is spiritual work. Uh, the uh, Book of Discipline 
uh, paragraph 258, which I'll reference that again if you miss those numbers, 258, says that people who serve on the staff parish committee, so the staff parish committee, should be people who are engaged in and attentive to their Christian spiritual development. And one of our tasks is to engage in theological and biblical reflections on the mission of the church. And so this is spiritual work. Uh, and so that means that uh, it is important for you to carve out daily prayer and devotion, that you engage in regular worship, that you practice spiritual disciplines, that you stay grounded. It also is about how that spiritual um, power within us allows us to be a non-anxious presence. We don't want to contribute to um, anxiety. We don't want to contribute uh, to worry. We want to be uh, a grounded leader um, so that people can focus on what really matters. Uh, now, number two, uh, if we'll change slides, go to the next slide, is that we are to build strong relationships. And it's not just your relationship with a pastor. It, it may be that your relationship with staff as well, but with, with also with the congregation. Um, Bev has done a good job of uh, laying the biblical uh, foundation and, and framework for that. Um, but I think there's a couple of practical ways that we can focus on relationships. One, we can be good listeners. To be on the staff parish committee means you have to employ your best listening skills. It may be listening to the pastor. It may be listening to someone in the, the congregation. It may be engaging in, in conversation with the district superintendent. Be a good listener. Uh, secondly, ask good questions that get to deeper uh, issues uh, or deeper questions. If someone raises a concern to you, and, and often that happens in a, in a church, you will receive a concern from a parishioner. Ask some good questions. Ask them, why is this important to you? Um, ask them to tell you more uh, about what, the, what they mean. Or if your pastor or someone on the staff has participated in a continuing education event, ask them some good questions. What did you learn from that? How do you see that um, benefiting uh, the ministry of the church? Or if you are leading your committee to make a decision uh, or to uh, determine a course of action, ask the group some really good questions. What do you think will be different? Um, as a result of this course of action, what are our hopes? Are we getting to that which really matters? And I think thirdly, to, to get uh, personally specific um, when you affirm your pastor and staff, personally care, uh, whether that's uh, affirming their life and call, um, knowing about their favorites uh, or their hobbies, um, that's a wonderful way to build relationships. Now, the third area, if you'll change slides, thank you, um, is to work with a parent to fulfill legal and ethical responsibilities. And the way I say this is that you, you have to know the details and you have to know that they're being attended to faithfully. And that would be things like um, HR matters, human resource matters, and uh, tax information. Um, of course, the size of your congregation depends on um, what these matters might be. What does the discipline say about the work of the pastor and the work of the staff parish committee? What is our misconduct policy? What is the vacation and continuing education policy? Maybe you have a social media policy for your staff, um, the safe sanctuary policy, what are the district reports and documents that we need to attend to? Now, some of these are going to be in the resource packet that you will receive um, after this um, webinar is over. But it's important that we know those details and that we school ourselves on that information. So to recap, um, one, we stay spiritually strong. 
Two, we build strong relationships. Three, we know the details. And finally, number four, we'll change slides. Thank you. We use our, our wisdom, discernment, and mercy. We remember that our faith is built on grace. Um, remember that you are not alone in this work. There are other people in the congregation, other people who are experienced and spiritually mature, who may be persons that you can call on for advice and encouragement. Your district superintendent is available if you need to talk through or process um, a concern or a situation. And I would also add that when we face conversations that are difficult, and often that can happen in the staff parish committee, if you find yourself in a place where you're having to offer correction or deal with a concern, or maybe there's a tough issue that you have to work through, or when the answer is not what someone wants to hear, then always in all of those situations, ask yourself and ask your group, ask your committee, where is the grace? Even in the midst of holding one another accountable, dealing with a tough issue, uh, differ, differing perspectives and opinions, we always ask, where is the grace? Stay spiritually strong, build strong relationships, know the details, and remember to ask, where is the grace? Now, I mentioned paragraph 258. Uh, that is kind of the go-to paragraph for the Staff Parish Committee. A copy of that will be in the resource page, uh, the resource packet that you will receive. Um, and this gives you an, an outline of the duties, all the ins and outs, the details of the Staff Parish Committee. And there are a couple of words that are used at the um, uh, beginning of the list of duties for the Staff Parish Committee. And those are encourage, strengthen, nurture, support, and respect. I wanted to just list a few things that can happen uh, with each of those words with your work in the Staff Parish Committee. Um, to encourage, what does that mean for the Staff Parish Committee to encourage? Well, it means to encourage the um, staff and the pastor in public as well as in private uh, to, to do so in word and in deed and to do so authentically and specifically. It also means to offer feedback and guidance that builds up and does not tear down. Uh, to nurture and support, that means to care personally for people, to, to know specifics about their, their life. Um, one time, um, a staff parish committee uh, member knew that I was dealing with a particular health issue, and that person would write uh, notes to me um, focused on that particular issue that was a specific way to encourage and support me, and I will always be thankful for those words of encouragement. You can also nurture and support your pastor and staff by guarding the time that they need for prayer and study. Uh, in, in order to do sermon preparation, much time is needed um, for study and prayer um, for sermon preparation. And so you can help the congregation understand um, that that's a part of the pastor's schedule and part of the pastor's workload. Also time for vacation. Uh, the vacation policy will be in the resource packet, uh, as well as continuing education information that will be a good resource for you. Make sure that you give attention to the continuing education budget uh, for your church so that the pastor and staff can receive financial support to do the growing and learning that we all need. Another word is to strengthen. 
What does that mean to strengthen our pastor and staff? Well, it means to pray for them, to hold them in prayer. It means to frequently and truthfully defend them. It means to speak the truth and love to your pastor. And then that last word, respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. It means to speak honorably of your pastor, even when others do not. It means to guard family and private boundaries. And it means to be willing to work through disagreements and differences. There will be, in every church and every human community, disagreements and differences, differences of opinion, uh, conflict. But as staff parish members, we respect not only the pastor and staff, but also the church when we model a willingness to not just throw up our hands and give up when there's conflict, but a willingness to work through that and to seek understanding. So paragraph 258 will also give you information about who is on the, the staff parish committee. And that would be the next slide, Lynn. Thank you. Um, of course, the charge conference uh, elects those members. Um, a minimum of five, no more than nine members. Your lay member to annual conference and your lay leader are members of this committee. And they're not, uh, they're officio, which means by virtue of their office and position, they are voting members of, of this committee. Um, the committee should be structured in a three-year class. New people as well as experienced people on this committee. And of course, if uh, someone is an employee of the church or an immediate family member residing in the same household, um, or residing in the same household, they should not be a member of the staff parish committee. But the characteristics, this just kind of summarizes what we've already talked about, um, are folks who regularly attend worship, promote and support missions, participate in Bible study and prayer groups, and who give generously to the ministry of the church. There is information in the Book of Discipline about the meetings uh, it should be held at least quarterly, um, but meetings can be called by the bishop or the district superintendent, by the pastor, the chair of the committee, or someone accountable to the committee, such as a staff person. The group cannot meet without the knowledge of the pastor or the superintendent. Um, the pastor should always know um, if there needs to be a, a meeting of the staff parish committee. Um, the committee meets in closed session <clears throat> and observes confidentiality. There is a confidentiality pledge that will be in your resource packet that many churches use uh, to review and to sign um, at the beginning of each calendar year. And that's a good way to emphasize confidentiality. You might think about that in terms of an HR department in um, business and how um, uh, especially personal information would not be shared broadly. Um, but I also think that in a church, it's important to think about the difference between confidentiality and communication. Sometimes there's confusion when people feel that there are, are things that the staff parish is working on that the congregation needs to know. And in, in, that, in those situations, the whole committee should agree and work on what of that matters and needs to be communicated with the congregation and that message, that messaging then be consistent instead of everyone going out telling their own story about what's going on. The staff peer committee can together agree on what that communication needs to be. I'd be glad to answer any other um, questions about confidentiality, or your superintendent may um, have some really good advice about um, confidentiality. Um, the administrative task um, 
a good summary of that, uh, a good way to think about those tasks. Um, communication among pastor, staff, congregation, and DS. So the Staff Parish Committee is kind of the, the link uh, between the district conference and local congregation, between the, the pastor and the congregation. Uh, it's uh, really important to maintain a connection with the district superintendent. Um, and then also a, a big part of your work is offering evaluation and feedback and encouragement for clergy and, and staff. And uh, when we look at uh, kind of how the whole year can, um, can be um, organized, one of the things that we encourage is that you're, you're looking all through the year at what um, the goals are and the priorities um, that you would have for the pastoral work of, of the congregation. It's important that the, the pastor and the staff parish committee have very rich conversation around expectations, priorities, assessment, and, and goals. And now I'm going to turn it back over to um, Bev Copley, and she's going to share with us a little bit about conducting those meetings. Thank y'all. Hey, it's Bev again. I have spent um, months of my life, possibly even years, in staff parish meetings over my many years of ministry since 1989, and especially since becoming a superintendent in 2018. And I have found that really a church is usually no more healthy than its staff parish committee meetings. If you have good, uh, healthy staff parish committee meetings, your church is usually exhibiting uh, health as well, and your church is usually growing. Uh, so I think there's nothing more important than a good staff parish meeting. So I just want to talk a, a couple minutes about how to conduct a meeting. This is especially for chairs. But if you're on the committee, I want you just to kind of think about when you've experienced the best staff parish meetings and kind of start to think about 2022 and think, could this be a year that we have really great meetings? Um, it all starts with preparation. Uh, something like I read from Philippians 1 is a nice way to begin a meeting. Something from scripture. Uh, as United Methodist, scripture is our foundation. Um, I found the Psalms and the Proverbs to be also good uh, letters. Um, words from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus' uh, seminal teaching uh, about how we live together and the one another's of Christian life are really good beginnings. Always a prayer. Uh, and a prayer is really a, not only a prayer of, um, of adoration for what God's done that day, but a prayer of invocation for the Holy Spirit to hover over the meeting. Um, every year, uh, I have seen it healthy to review paragraph 258.2, which Laura just went over. Um, I give out copies. Um, I, I usually advise my chairs and prepare those copies and just say, let's, let's read over it again. W what's our work? Um, that's especially important for people who are new to the committee who might be coming on without a knowledge of United Methodism and might be coming on with assumptions. Uh, this is a, a committee for a certain task or, uh, you know, and, and not understand the breadth of the work. Uh, it's very important to elect a vice chair. If not, you're only going to be able to have a meeting when the chair can be there. If the chair is called away, you're going to be slowed down. Um, a secretary. Uh, it's huge to have a secretary. I've been in so many meetings where I've wondered who's documenting this, uh, who's accountable for this, where are we writing the action items, and where will this be recorded if anything comes up in the future that we need to be able to say we put down in the words of our church history. Um, set ground rules for how we'll uh, behave with each other. I'll say more about that after a while. Um, take good minutes, archive the documentation, uh, a notebook, a binder, uh, you know, a, a, a file on, on someone's computer that does get to the church's permanent file. A lot of people say, well, why do we need that? Because we're really just talking about relationships. Um, you might not need it tonight. Uh, but you might need it six months from now uh, when you're in the process of making some difficult decisions. Um, start and end the meetings on time. Uh, I like a 90-minute max. People are tired. 
Uh, there, there's really not an instance unless they're coming in bright and early in the morning where they ought, haven't already been doing something else that day. Be aware of that. Uh, we uh, have had very successful staff parish meetings with refreshments uh, as we're coming out of COVID. I, I recommend uh, in-person meetings as much as possible, uh, water, uh, breaking of bread. When that's possible, I have seen that it uh, does help. Uh, I always offer refreshments at my office when staff parish committees come in because they're tired. And at first, they're a little sheepish about taking it. And by the end of the evening, we've all had water and, and snacks, and we all feel, feel much better. Um, I try to include some time of learning and education in each meeting, uh, even if it's just talking about uh, one important aspect of, of, the, um, of the work, which, for example, uh, discerning who in our church is, is fit to, to, to be spoken to about uh, the possibility that God might be working in their lives to call them into ministry. Who do we see out there? Um, we must continue to cultivate new candidates for ministry. Um, you hear reports from pastors and staff. Those vary. Tell your pastor, tell your staff what you'd like them to report on, or else they'll report on all these things that you don't really care about. Uh, they'll go over the mileage and the odometer. Uh, but ask them what, tell them what's important, and then ask them to report. This is especially true for your clergy who resource your committee, typically just a senior pastor. Um, review decisions and recommendations. What I usually do is, is put a little box on the agenda, and that box is action items, and, and everybody uh, knows what the action items as we're going forward into the next uh, meeting, into the next season. You can come back, and it certainly helps the secretary with uh, actionable minutes. Um, we're going to want to walk through real quick what the year might look like. Let's say that you only meet four times a year, the discipline minimum. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, you don't need to have six hours worth of meetings every month. Um, but let's say you just meet once a, once a quarter. We want to walk you through the year. Um, I, again, I've already mentioned the, the orientation, the welcome. Get to know the new members. Uh, thank them. Ask them their story about how they came to the church. Uh, and then... Um, Review the paragraph. That's when I usually hand out the, the paragraph at the beginning. Um, if there's any goals that are in process, be sure the new people know what the goals are. Bring them up to speed. I've also found the first meeting of the year a good time to celebrate the anniversary dates of staff. Uh, for example, our, our custodian is celebrating uh, his seventh year at the church in 2022, and uh, we want to be aware of the faithfulness that, that he has provided. It's a good time to celebrate everybody's anniversary dates. And then we review relationships um, the, the, with the pastors, with the staff. Uh, let the new members know what the staff uh, is, is configured to do. Give them job descriptions that exist. Um, talk about the affiliated clergy who might have their charge conference relationship in your church. In my district, we have about 90 retirees, and we're so proud of them, and we want to be in relationship with them. So we celebrate uh, that a particular minister has found a home in our congregation, and we celebrate that person just as we celebrate the appointed clergy. Uh, it's also a good time to name candidates. Uh, we want to let the committee know that Noah is a candidate for ministry and, and, and share some things about him. It's just a good beginning. Um, identify future ministry candidates. Ask yourself, who, who is God speaking to? What do we see in fruit that we want to name? And then we establish and review a plan for dealing with rumors and with conflict. Very important to do that while there's no rumor and no conflict afoot. Uh, when things are fresh and new, this is how we do this. New members, if you've if you've been on the committee before and, and this was the old way of dealing with rumors and conflict, those days are over. This is the way we're going to deal with this at this time for the health of the church. Because remember, a church is usually no more healthy than their best staff parish meeting. So it's very, very important. I'm going to turn it back to Laura. She's going to walk us through the middle of the year, and then Londa will walk us through the last quarter of the year. Thank you, Bev. Thank you. For the April, um, May, and June time period, it may depend on whether or not you're anticipating um, a pastoral move. 
So if you are anticipating a pastoral move, a change of appointments, then the things that you would want to attend to would be the uh, plans and policies for pastoral changes, the, the moving packet and the, the consultation and conversation with the district superintendent. Um, you would want to make sure that the parsonage and housing issues are attended to, a parsonage inspection is done, and you would want to plan for the goodbye uh, and hello uh, events, saying goodbye and saying hello uh, when there's a, a transition of clergy leadership. If you are not anticipating a move, then this is still a good time to uh, do a parsonage review and to make sure that everything is in order uh, with clergy housing. Um, it, perhaps it's a good time to review expectations and goals, uh, perhaps a good time to review legal matters, um, um, misconduct policies, or social media policies. Then in July and September, that's usually a, um, a, a month that's not, months that are not very busy because of, of summer travel and, and so forth, but uh, it is, um, there's still things that need to be done and can be done that it may be a great time to review the job descriptions for the staff and to make sure they're up to date. Um, maybe you need to uh, consult with an, uh, an HR person or an accountant to make sure that lay employees are designated properly. Um, this would be an important time to review the salary and benefit packages, not only for the pastor, but also staff, as the staff peers committee will help the uh, church council, the administrative board, um, prepare for charge conference decisions. Um, that, that's important that you begin thinking about that work uh, in the July through September time period. A great time to look at safe sanctuary, personnel policies, continuing education events as, as the pastor and staff have they done the continuing education that they need to do. Um, if there's assessment work, that will need to be done. This is a good time to uh, know what that is and to be prepared for that. Um, and then Londa is going to um, begin talking with us about our favorite time of the year, which uh, is the fall and charge conference season. I say that with a smile on my face. Again, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Londa Wallace, District Administrator for the Northern Piedmont District. I'm going to speak with you briefly about the last quarter of the year and forms and policies. It's important that um, the local church profile is updated every year on the conference web website, and you access that through your um, church dashboard, and you must have a login and username for your church dashboard. There's only one per church. So please be sure to check with your pastor or your treasurer or your office staff about that username and password to access your dashboard. Reports for charge conference. One of the responsibilities of the PPR committee is the compensation page uh, that needs to be submitted at charge conference. End of the year is important to complete any unfinished business. If the PPR committee met in January and talked about what we might do throughout the year, where are we now? Where are we um, at the end of the year with regards to any unfinished business? Uh, it's important to have a date to complete your move advisory forms. The advisory forms um, normally come in December of the year, and it's important to have a meeting to talk about the advisory form. The form requires your pastor to sign it, as well as every member in attendance at the meeting must sign it. And if there is going to be a possible change or a request, there will need to be a consultation with the superintendent. So by completing the advisory form, we will uh, reach out to schedule that consultation and you feel free to email us about the schedule of consultation with the superintendent. Relating to forms and policies, we talked about the church profile and again, it's on your church dashboard. Um, church conference reports are in the fall. Your clergy compensation, the pastor parish, recommends the compensation to church council and church council um, presents it to your charge conference and your charge conference will 
vote on that. Um, the clergy assessments, they are held, they are done annually, and we will share additional information with you as a PPR chairperson closer to that time of year when those need to be done. Your safe sanctuary policy and ongoing refinement. Your policy should be looked at every year. This was mandated in 1996 that every local church have a safe sanctuary policy. And it needs to be in your, in your church office uh, and not filed away. And you must upload a copy of your safe sanctuary policy to your church dashboard every year, along with your charge conference report. An employee handbook. Do you have one? You may not think you need one until you need one. Oftentimes, we'll get calls about lay employees. They'll call the district office about lay employees. And we'll say, what does your employee handbook say about that? So it's important to have an uh, employee handbook. And it's, that's another document that needs to be on the office desk. Um, make sure that those persons that need it have it. And it should be looked at every year. And again, your move advisory forms um, will be available in December. So I'll um, go from there. Can you all hear me? Um, I'll go from there and talk a little bit about the MOVE advisories and the consultation process. Won't spend very much time here, but we'll talk about how important the church profile is. Um, a lot of times we see that clergy simply just take it upon themselves to fill this out. Um, it's quick to do it that way, but it's not always best. And I really encourage staff parishes to fill out their own church profile and to be aware that it's the first piece of information that your new pastor, when you have one, uh, will receive about your church. So make sure it represents what you want to say. Uh, I will say the same things to our clergy about their own clergy profiles. Um, we've had a lot of clergy who have used the clergy profile as a time to vent about various things that are going on in their lives. And that's not a very good document to give to your new church. So I want you to be aware of that. And those profiles really matter. They matter to us and they matter to churches and to clergy. So it's, it's crucial that that is uh, really up to speed. I also want to talk about how important it is to have the form signed. Uh, that means everybody's on the same page. You may not be of the same mind or spirit about the decision that was made, but you're all aware of it. That helps me and my superintendent colleagues in our process with you because we don't see any reason that there should be surprises. Uh, sometimes those can only be hurtful. So that's your work to do in advance of the consultation process. Consultation. Um, it happens all the time. I'll say more about that in the next slide. But consultation is a very important sharing opportunity. It needs to be really honest. It needs to be a really healthy, courageous conversation. And uh, it, it needs to be something that you understand as advisory. Um, all of the moves, uh, all of the positioning of all of our clergy throughout the annual conference is completely based on the mission of the local church. It's not based on the needs or desires of, of various clergy. Uh, it's not based on personality uh, thoughts and uh, stereotypes about what churches would like to have. Um, and it's, it's based on the mission of the church. Uh, there are pastors who may want to move, who will actually remain in place because they are needed there for the mission of the church. There are some churches who will request a move, but will keep their pastor because the mission of the church is most important, as opposed to stereotypes, personalities, or uh, even personal differences. Uh, so it is an advisory process. Uh, I want you to know that the bishop and the cabinet take this work very serious. It is seriously, it is, it's, it's tedious, uh, it's prayer field, it's difficult, um, and it, it's comprehensive because we have many, many clergy and many, many churches, and our goal is to be great stewards of all of our personnel resources throughout the conference to fulfill the mission of the local church. Um, consultation is always happening. Uh, this is very important for you to know. Um, it's happening all year long. Uh, it happened for me this morning when I, I spent time visiting three churches uh, through their streaming services. Uh, that was a time of consultation with me. I have conversations with pastors, with SPRCs all year long. 
small congregate conversations, intimate conversations, and also larger committee conversations. Um, we are always having uh, a consultation. We help you all uh, a lot with your facility concerns and, and decisions that you're making around right of ways that affect the church or the building of a new, uh, a new family life center. So consultation is always happening. I meet with your pastors uh, about their continuing education plans and, and, and their work in emerging leadership events. Uh, it's always happening that we are building our relationships, just like Paul uh, did in Philippi behind me, and uh, just as Jesus did with his disciples and with everyone he met, the most important thing for him was to get into a relationship, not to cast judgment, uh, not to, uh, to, to make a ruling over that person's spirit or possibilities, but to make a relationship. So we think it's very important to know that consultation is always happening. Now, I want to get to the heart of the matter uh, about what we do when we find that there are differences, differences between what a member of the committee might want uh, and what a, uh, a pastor might want or need or the cultural context that a pastor might come from. I want to give a huge shout out to InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization. Uh, it's in college campuses. And uh, they developed this, uh, this little slide that I just can't get enough of. And I shared a lot with people. And, and I had it shared with me uh, first, first time by a person who was on staff of InterVarsity. And it's about how we approach differences with people. And most of the time, our differences are actually cultural differences. I'll give you an example. Um, I, pro, I've served a lot of great churches, and some of the people from my great churches are on this call. So I, I don't want to say anything uh, untoward about any of the churches I've ever served. But I was probably the biggest mismatch at First United Methodist Church in Landis, North Carolina, where I served for five years and left uh, grief stricken because I, I still miss them to this day. They were my Philippi. And, uh, but the funny thing is that when I went to serve at that church, I was just coming off the staff of a very large congregation, University City in Charlotte, a great church. Uh, and there were cultural differences between University City and Landis. And there were also cultural differences between me, uh, who grew up in a rather hoity-toity high church setting and Landis, uh, which was full of plain spoken people who did not really abide much frou-frou. And it was uh, amazing because uh, they were open and accepting and trusting and adaptable of me. They, they knew that from the minute I walked in that I, I did not come from Landis, that I was a very different person, even though my father had spent a lot of time in Landis in the textile industry, but I'd never been there. And I was coming from a big church, having been raised in a big church, and it was a small church. Um, instead of seeing me with suspicion and fear and superiority and prejudice, and instead of me seeing them with suspicion and fear and superiority and prejudice, I came in. And they greeted me with openness, acceptance, trust, and adaptability. Did we have our cultural differences? Yes. Yes. It was about all sorts of things. Did I need to wear a, a robe and a stole every Sunday? Uh, did we really need to stand for the gospel? Um, how were we going to remodel the sanctuary or, or build a playground uh, that suited that town, not, not my own needs for uh, what I was used to in a church uh, that was of a certain size or stature. Uh, did we have frustration, misunderstandings, confusion, tension, embarrassment, and aggression? Yeah, you better believe it. You better believe it because a lot of people uh, didn't appreciate uh, my desire to let that church's light shine in the community. They liked it just the way it was. Now, Coming out of that, did we stay in the green? Did we stay related? Or did we move to the red? And you can translate this any way you want to. You can look at our country. You can look at our world. You can look at the division that we experience in our nation right now. And we can ask ourselves, did I stay green lined, as you might say, the top of this diagram? Or did I red line? 
And I notice uh, in body language, I notice in, um, in emails, letters, and phone calls, uh, a beginning of many conversations that start in the red line, a suspicion, a fear, a superiority, a prejudice. And my work, uh, you might say, is uh, in the middle of that splat and coming out of that splat to help people get to the green line, to help people get to where they can listen to each other, observe, inquire, and initiate, with the result being understanding, empathy, and deepened relationships, the kind that Paul talked about right here at the river behind me. Um, we don't want criticism, rationalizing, self-isolation. We don't want alienation, withdrawal, and broken relationships. Uh, to me, this work happens on the micro level with every member of the congregation. It happens on a macro level in staff parish committee meetings and other leadership venues. The dissonance is always going to happen. There's always going to be a disagreement. At, at my dear Landis Church, um, it happened uh, It happened in a funny way. And, and it happened to me with one of the people that I love the most in the church. Her name was Midgey. And it happened one day when the trustee chair came and said, I'm going to take the theater seating chairs out of the choir room. I mean, excuse me, out of the choir loft. And I need to go ahead and tell you, I'm not going to put them back. Because that fixed seating is not giving us the flexibility that we need for the future of this church. And I said, sir, I'm excited about that. And I'm with you, but you're going to start a war. You're going to start a splat. And uh, there were some tense moments and, and, and even screen doors were slammed on the day that that it was decided by the trustees that they would not put the theater seating back into that space. And that was at, at my Landis church. And, and I had one of the people that I loved the most in that church get really sore at me. And I, I stayed on the green line. And so did she. And we moved forward together, but that could have been a red line relationship end. But we were committed to our relationship with each other, most of all. That's just a little vignette. It's, it's, it's significant in the scheme of all of Christian history, whether or not theater style seats are in the choir loft or if it's an open space for different seating or even standing in the future. Um, it, what matters, though, is how you go into a conversation. That could be the beginning of your pastor's tenure. It could even be the end of it. But how you go into the conversation, what happens during it, how you respond, and what will the result be going forward? Will you be on the green line or will you be on the red line? Uh, the truth is, uh, it's going to be in the splat. There's going to be one. There's going to be dissonance. There's nothing about this chart that, that indicates that there will not be dissonance. There, there's not a scenario where everybody just stays magically on the green line without any relationship challenges. That's even true in Philippi behind me and all of the other churches that Paul visited during uh, his, his travels in the book of Acts and beyond. Um, but it's very important for us to be aware that we are making a personal choice about how we will stay in relationships with people. Uh, it makes me sad sometimes because I do feel like a lot of people believe that relationships are disposable. And uh, I don't believe that that is a part of Christian theology. I think that's why we have grace and forgiveness and restoration. I think it's why we have reconciliation and why we have truth that we can come together. And, and I was able to say uh, with compassion, uh, I understood I understood how certain people might have felt on that day that those theater style chairs didn't go back into that space. Uh, that person that I loved had sat in one of those chairs for 30 years and I loved her. And, and it was very important uh, to me that, that she understand what the other person was thinking uh, about the future and that we had a really important holy conversation about it. Uh, so that's that diagram. This is going to be in your uh, work that you can take with you and that will be in your packet.
Um, just very quickly, um, I want to talk about how we approach conflict and concerns, and then we're going to close up and uh, we're going to go to some um, other meeting links where you can meet your own DS and, and talk to her or talk to him uh, and ask questions and just build that relationship that Paul was talking about in Philippi. Um, approaching conflict and concerns. Uh, complaints must be put into writing. This is very important uh, to me. Uh, when I receive a phone call, uh, I, I document the conversation that has taken place. If you're a chair, you need to do that too. Put a date at the top and, and write it down. And if the person uh, is wanting this to be entered into conversation at a meeting, let them know they need to put it in writing to you. Uh, one of my favorite things is when people say people are saying uh, people are, this is a way that, that they can deflect the personal ownership of the conversation. And uh, that's usually code for, I think personally, that this is happening. I usually, when people say people are saying, I usually say, can you give me their names? And there's usually a really awkward silence there. Um, I, I just, this is just real important to health uh, and green lining. Complaints must be signed. I, I will let you know that if I ever get anonymous letters, um, I throw them away. I do not put them in anyone's file and I do not attend to it at all. If you send an anonymous letter to our office, it goes into what we call the circular file or the trash can. Um, and by the way, uh, emails are not anonymous. There, there is no way to send an anonymous email. And it, it's good for you to kind of be in a practice of understanding uh, that. Always ask, have you taught, this is what I ask, have you talked to the pastor yourself? If you're a chair and, and you have a complaint or you're a member and you, you're receiving a complaint, have you talked to Pastor Jim about this? And there's usually a silence there too that indicates that there is uh, some triangulation in the relationship instead of talking to the person who needs to be talked to. Um, if, you, if you do email me or call me, I will respond uh, and I'll copy the pastor in. I do not uh, abide the secret of a triangle where we are talking about a pastor behind his or her back. Um, biblical conversations are very important. Uh, Matthew 18 indicates how we do this. It's okay to go alone at first. And if you don't get what you need from that conversation, then you take one or two others and then you go as a church. There are biblical ways to uh, deal with conflict. And you know what that tells us? That in the Bible, there was conflict. That there, we don't stop being the church together because there are disagreements. The Old Testament is full of disagreements and the New Testament is full of disagreements, but there are methods uh, for addressing them in a Christian way. Um, some congregants complain about the pastor as a way of slowing down the mission. Uh, I'll give an example from the times before the pandemic, perhaps about a new worship service. Uh, if, if there's a energy mounting for a worship service that might re reach a new generation of people, sometimes there are people who will want to change the pastor so we won't have to have the new worship service. Uh, that slows the mission. It's a way of avoiding difficult tasks of conversations uh, when a pastor's really making some ground on a, on a situation that's really hung the church up for a long time. Sometimes people want to move the pastor because it's feeling a little bit uh, uncertain about how we're going to navigate this and, and what might be at stake as we seek health for the church. So there's usually some motivation behind some complaints. Now, sometimes there's a real complaint and we must know about it. You know we hold our pastors to the highest accountability. And we need to know, uh, but everything uh, is not important. And you receive the concerns and you remember that you don't have to act on every single concern. Um, at a church I, I, I served and the chair, the current chair of, of that church is now on this call and I'm glad he's with us. We had a space in every staff parish meeting to receive concerns. It was on the agenda every time. And, and sometimes we just listened. Uh, people would, would tell us something that might be a concern. Maybe it's something, maybe the organ was too loud uh, and we need to talk to the organist or something like that. Um, we would decide if how we would attend to that concern. 
Sometimes at the end of that time, we would just say, okay, the chair would say, okay, we received these concerns, now let's move on. Um, instead of making another hour and a half meeting around when should the organ play um, grand volume in hymns and when should it not? Uh, we just said, thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, I'm gonna turn it back now uh, to Laura and it may be that this is good conversation for the breakout session. You, you, may, you may even be in your mind, not the breakout session, the next meeting, remember it's a different link. Um, but it, there may be a scenario in your mind and you're wondering, is this major? Is this the kind of thing that needs to take nine to 11 uh, church leaders and the pastor two hours of time to discuss? Or, or, or is there another avenue that we could address this to keep everyone in relationship uh, as best we can. Uh, so I'll turn it back to, to Laura and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Bev. Uh, just as the finance committee and your congregation are, uh, they are stewards of the financial resources of the congregation. And just as the trustees are stewards of the property um, and the, uh, the church building, the staff parish committee are stewards of the pastor and staff, their gifts, their time, and their energy. And so the work of the staff parish is um, very crucial to the whole congregation staying focused on the mission. And so these are some really good questions for us to end on, uh, for the staff parish committee to consider how are we doing in helping our congregation become more like Christ? How are we helping our community grow deeper in their relationships with God and each other and the community? How are we relevant, present, and transformative in our community in this season? And how is our pastor and staff guiding us in this work? You can see how important the staff parish work is for the whole of the mission and ministry of the local church. Now, at this time, I want to uh, see if Londa has uh, received any questions that would be helpful for us to address before we go to our separate district meetings. Um, and as she's doing that, as she's uh, seeing if there's any questions we can address, I wanna just thank you for taking time to uh, participate in this webinar this afternoon. And also um, remind you that at five o'clock, uh, Bishop Carter will offer a keynote address uh, as we kind of kick off our winter leadership uh, training week. Uh, there's more information about all of the, the courses um, and his webinar at five o'clock today on the conference website. Um, Wanda, any questions? We, we do not. I imagine everyone, well, one just popped up. I was going to say, I imagine everyone is waiting to go into their individual district uh, conversation with their superintendent. Okay. Um, one just popped up. Well, they're asking about the slides. When will the slides be available? We're going to send, we'll send all that now. I'm going to ask Lynn if she will give us some instructions. I, I saw one question in the in the chat, and and I think uh, I think that's a great question about um, getting concerns from the the congregation. Often they they come to you, whether you seek them out or not. But I think that's where those skills of listening, listening very carefully, and um, encouraging positive um, in, in a positive manner to um, receive feedback that is constructive. Um, so uh, I think it was Dwight that was asking that. Um, that might be a good part of conversation for of conversation to have uh, in your individual district group as well. And I, I might add to that, Laura, uh, about uh, Dwight's very good question. One of the things that I've seen successful is uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, same as this, around the same time that everyone's getting trained, uh, for the work on staff parish is to share with the congregation who the new members are and, and how the process of, of that work 
uh, takes place. And uh, to educate them, it's especially good to, um, to educate the church council because that's a key place where uh, what, what some conversations that might be hearsay happen uh, for the staff parish chair to educate uh, everyone to stand up in in uh, in the in, perhaps in the congregation and share, and that's even a great time to say another thing we're celebrating is that our, our custodian James is beginning his seventh year, etc. So there are lots of ways to let the church know how uh, the staff parish works in a healthy, healthy model. Yeah. That's a great question, Dwight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Beth. All right, Lynn, do you need to say anything about uh, the breakout rooms? <laughs> I've put the, the links and I'll put them again in the, uh, the chat. Uh, the easiest way is to use this link I'm pasting right now. Uh, it takes you to our website where there's a link for each district to click your district. Uh, the as soon as the recording the, is posted uh, on the conference website, we will share with everyone who registered today uh, the link to the recording and the link to the resource packet that um, uh, Bev and Laura have mentioned. So um, everybody will get that. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. We appreciate our uh, tech support today. So I pray that uh, the Lord will bless you and keep you, that you stay spiritually strong, uh, that you seek to build relationships, that uh, you attend to details uh, into the, the tedious work that can be involved um, in this, but that you will always seek uh, to ask the question, where is God's grace in the midst um, of, of this situation, of this ministry, of this church? Where is the grace? May the Lord bless you and keep you. Go in peace. <laughs>